Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I'm Garth Manning, Wonka's CEO. And no matter which part of the globe you're in or what time zone you're on, you're most welcome to this, the latest Wonka webinar with the theme of aging and health. With a great panel lined up for you, led by Professor Dimity Pond from Australia, who's chair of Wonka's special interest group on aging and health. And the panel also includes Professor Lee King Hock of Singapore, Dr. Leon Geffen of South Africa, Professor Sanya Sabzwari of Pakistan, and Professor Nina Kopchevar Gutchek of Slovenia. So a very global panel indeed. You can feed any of your comments and questions through the chat facility on Zoom or through our Facebook or Twitter channels. And your questions will be monitored by Drs. Fairuz Ali and Wong Ping Fu. In a few moments, I'll hand over to Dimity to chair the session and make further introductions. But first of all, I'd like to play a short video message from Wonka's president, Dr. Donald Lee. Good morning, afternoon, evening. Thank you for taking time during your busy schedule to attend the second series of Wonka webinars. Family doctors around the world have risen to the challenge of this awful pandemic. In the midst of the massively increased workload for family doctors, I'm proud of the level of support and collegiality displayed within and across our member organizations and from region to region. It is heartening indeed. Indeed, the COVID-19 pandemic is bringing a lot of changes to our professional and personal lives. We are slowly adapting to the use of technology to overcome barriers and challenges created by the pandemic. We are getting used to meet virtually and using the cyberspace like what we're doing now. Colleagues are disseminating scientific advice, clinical updates, reflective messages, and professional support through their social media links and connections. They're keeping in touch with each other regularly, like family members, relaying information, urging courage in these extraordinary times. I think all those who participated or listened in our various webinars held in June and July will agree they have been well received and appreciated by many fam family doctors around the world. I'm really looking forward to the next series of webinars, which will include presentations from our working party and special interest groups on health equity, women and family medicine, e-health, aging and health, complexities, mental health, palliative care, adolescent and young adults, as well as the environment. Before I hand it over to the convener of this webinar, I would like to say that unfortunately, this is a pandemic with an unknown end game. I wish each and every one of our family doctors well during this time. Use the best advice available, work collaboratively with your teams, do the best you can for your patients. You should stand proud of your contributions in facing the world crisis. No one knows what will be ahead of us in the weeks, but everybody knows enough to understand that COVID-19 will test our capacities to be kind and generous and to see beyond ourselves and our interests. Our task now is to bring the best of who we are and what we do to a world that is more complex and more confused than any of us would like it to be. May we all proceed with wisdom and grace. Thank you. Thank you to Donald Lee, our president, for his message. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to hand over to Professor Dimity Pond, who will act as Master of Ceremonies for the rest of the session. Dimity. Thank you, Garth. And welcome to all our audiences on all the various uh, modalities that they're watching this. Uh, so I, without any more ado, I'll introduce our first speaker who's Professor Lee King Hock, who's the program leader for the Family Medicine Program at Duke NUS in Singapore. And he's going to speak to us about mobile connectivity as an emerging social determinant of health in Singapore. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. So hello, uh, family physician colleagues from around the world. I think we are all very grateful to Wonka for giving us this opportunity to come together and discuss something that is very important as we uh, battle COVID. Now, uh, as you all know, uh, the new world, the world has changed since COVID came. And uh, as we are zooming around, having meetings, uh, enforcing social distancing, I think one group 
of our population that got left behind and could be in worse situation is probably our seniors, especially those who are already social, socially isolated as it is. So I think it brings to the front this very this emerging social determinants of health called mobile connectivity. And I think uh, after COVID, this could be the new normal in the post-COVID world. And as the world become more and more connected and more reliant on the use of mobile technology, this lack of connectivity to the mobile world is really going to be a very serious social determinant on health that will be very disadvantageous to our seniors. Uh, next slide, please. So before I tell you what we did with social prescribing in Singapore, uh, I think it's useful to give you a little bit of background of how Singapore uh, work, operates our healthcare system. I think many of you might have heard that we are highly efficient. We spend just over 4% of our GDP on health and manage to get reasonably good results for outcome. And one of the best kept secret of our healthcare system is this system of community hospitals that we have. So community hospitals actually connect the acute hospitals to the primary care. So in the typical case of a Singaporean who falls uh, gravely ill, they will be admitted to one of our state-of-the-art tertiary hospitals or acute hospitals, where they will receive a uh, very good uh, medical intervention and diagnostic tests. But at the end of about four to six days, uh, most of the problems would have been diagnosed and whatever necessary procedures by specialist care would have been done. But then they are still not fully recovered and that's where we transfer them to a, a community hospital such as what, where we are working in, where we give them a longer runway to recover and to convalesce from their illness. So about 10 to 15% of family physicians in Singapore work in these very highly cost-effective uh, community hospitals. So I am working presently in a group of three community hospitals, totaling up to more than a thousand beds, and we provide rehabilitative care, sometimes end-of-life care for our patients, chronic sick patients who, are, who cannot be supported in nursing homes, and we also have uh, uh, outpatient service as a transitional care to our primary care colleagues. So acting as a bridge between the acute hospitals and the uh, and the community. Now the seniors who come to us are usually those who cannot recover as well. And one of the main reasons we notice time and again is the suboptimal social determinants of health that they experience. Next slide, please. So what is social prescribing? So social prescribing essentially links individuals to their community with a view of improving their social determinants of health. So we started our social prescribing model in secondary care. And I think uh, we are probably the first, although in other countries, they have started doing this in primary care. So what we did, do, did was that we have a team of what we call well-being coordinators. And I think they're called link workers in some other countries. Uh, they will carry out conversations with our patients, uh, find out what are the issues that they have with the social determinants of health. And then we will try to uh, encourage them to be active and participate in activities in our hospital with a view that when they are discharged, we will connect them to the community to continue such activities and to prevent social isolation or even to reverse uh, it in some cases. And after that, we will refer them to the community. And uh, in our community, we have uh, many services and community care providers. In some countries, it's called as a third sector. Uh, we do have that as well in Singapore, run by many uh, kind-hearted charities. But in Singapore, we have another secret source and that's called statutory boards. So these are actually uh, independent government funded bodies whose role is to quickly respond to the needs on the ground. And in this case, uh, there's this agency called the Community Network of Seniors, which actually essentially has many caregivers, uh, uh, sorry, case managers who will receive patients and link them back to the community, uh, trying their best to, to prevent social isolation. So we work closely with this Community Network of Seniors. Next slide, please. So when COVID hit us, uh, our, our project got disrupted. And I think the social isolation of our seniors got even further aggravated. So on the far left, you can see the uh, utilization of various types of uh, information technology uh, of our Singapore population. And if you notice the, the gray bar at the lowest end, second lowest end, this represents people above 60. And you can see that in all areas, they, are the, they, are, they have the least access to to computers, internet, and the digital technology. And 
So if you look at the last one, none of the above, that means where they do not have any access to the internet or mobile technology at all. Majority of Singaporeans actually are out of this, this, uh, this category, except for those who are, who are above 60, and you can see the percentage is 16%. Now this may be very good for some other countries, but in Singapore, which is highly wired and everyone is dependent on technology, to be completely disconnected from the digital world is really, really a serious disadvantage. And in the recent COVID, where we enforce social distancing, our poor seniors actually bear the brunt of the difficulties that uh, many of us face. So you can see in the pictures, common areas where they congregate and relax and connect to one another are all taped up and they are discouraged from leaving their homes uh, in, in the interest of pr protecting them and preventing them from catching the COVID virus. But of course, this, this did them a break the service in terms of their social isolation. Next slide, please. So the, social, the need for social prescribing become even more. And we decided that what we should do is to front loop the tech empowerment to our elderly during the inpatient stay with us. So we created what is called an e-social prescribing, which essentially is to enable them to get onto the digital world through their smartphone. Next slide. So for those who do not have smartphone, we try our best to uh, get donations and, uh, and many people came forward to uh, provide this uh, access. And after they received the smartphone, we designed a very simple three, three uh, session training focused on getting them on board into the digital world. So in Singapore, we have a Wi-Fi wireless SG called wireless SG, which is a free high speed internet access provided by the government. And we teach them how to log onto the Wi-Fi network from their mobile phone. The next thing we did was to teach them how to use WhatsApp, which is the most popular uh, social media in Singapore. And finally, we teach them how to use a QR code. Because in Singapore, if you need to enter a supermarket and many other places where you need to uh, get your daily supplies, you have to scan a QR code, which helps us to uh, do uh, contact tracing. So, but to most elderly, this is a big barrier to their access to all the necessary provisions of life. So in the design of these programs, we use adult learning principles to make it very interesting and easy for the seniors. And we did it in a group so that they also enjoy the whole process of learning as well. Next slide. So you can see that uh, I think this, to our Pleasant surprise, I think many of the seniors uh, took this up quite well. And as you can see, these are pictures of some of the lessons that we conducted. And you, they gave us a very encouraging response. Many of them uh, wrote very, uh, very heartfelt thanks to our well-being coordinators. And even the children who are the caregivers were very surprised that we managed to teach their elderly parents how to get online and how to uh, leave WhatsApp, call, uh, WhatsApp audio calls on their phones as well. Next slide. So then after that, what do we do? Now, another statutory body in Singapore is called the, uh, it's called the uh, uh, Infocom Media Development Authority of Singapore, IMDA. And what they did was also they were responding to this need. So they set up this Singapore Digital Office and within the space of a few months, they recruited 1,000 what is called uh, digital ambassadors who go around to the community to teach elderly how to get online as well. And for those who do not have phone or access to, uh, at the, to the uh, dig, uh, digital plans, what they did was also they provide, uh, they find ways and means to help these people to get a smartphone and access to the digital, uh, to the mobile, mobile data plan. Uh, so what we did then was to connect ourselves to this office. And when our patients leave our hospital, we connect them to the digital office and they continue their learning and connections to the digital world. Next slide. So I'd like to give an example uh, of one of the patients who went through our program. So she's an elderly lady who stays with the husband and son. Uh, both are working. So from Monday to Friday, she's home alone and socially isolated. It's only during the evening and the weekends when the husband and the son come home. Then, then she has some companionship and was, is able to leave the house. Uh, under their care. She stays in the public housing and uh, she came to our hospital uh, up for some rehabilitation after an acute illness. So what we did was we, we did 
this uh, assessment of their social prescribing using our tool called the SBAR4, and we established that she's, uh, in, she's socially isolated. And uh, one of the reasons was, of course, she doesn't have access to the mobile, uh, to the digital world. So we put her through the three lessons and she really enjoyed it and she got on well with the class. And when she left, she was very happy. She was, for the first time, she was able to use WhatsApp and leave a voice recording for the son. And then when the son found out, he was very pleased and even came down to the hospital during the visiting hours and gave her even further instructions. And he thanked us profusely, profusely for uh, our effort. And after discharge, what happened is that we used to have a befriender service that again got interrupted, which is provided by the community. So now we have digital uh, befrienders and we link them up through the community network of seniors and they were able to link up to the smartphone and continue to encourage her to use the WhatsApp to connect to the people outside. And uh, so we have a volunteer befriender who's helping her. And now she's uh, attending day rehab and progressing uh, very well in her recovery journey. Next slide. So uh, in conclusion, what we are going to do uh, moving ahead is first to improve our instruction, instructional design even further uh, with the help of the Institute of Adult Learning, which is a center that focuses on adult, uh, adult learning. And we are improving our connections to the community network of seniors, as well as the SG, SG Digital for, uh, Office. And last and most important, we are going to create a virtual social prescribing community network. That means uh, we are going to hold activities um, facilitate uh, seniors to come together and we will organize the online variety shows, bingo games, auctions, health education, infotainment, and so on. So that after they leave the hospital, they can continue to be socially connected to this virtual social prescribing community network. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lee King Ho. And that gives uh, me personally a lot of food for thought. Uh, about what I might be able to do in the community where my general practice is uh, in terms of uh, social prescribing. That's a really uh, interesting thought, that. Um, so we move on to the second of our four presentations today. Please feel free to post uh, questions in the chat or uh, if you're using one of the other uh, social media uh, forms, uh, they, they are also being monitored, uh, Twitter and uh, Facebook, and uh, so uh, you're welcome to do that. We will be answering questions at the end, but we'll also be monitoring the chat. I noticed someone's put a question up now, and uh, that it may be that one or the other of us can uh, give a preliminary answer. So we'll move ahead to our second speaker, Leon Geffen from the Samson Institute for Aging Research. Uh, uh, so Leon, uh, welcome. And I didn't, uh, say, I didn't say what part of Africa it's in. Could, would you mind please filling us in on that? Uh, good morning, Timothy. Uh, well, and thank you very much for uh, including me in this webinar series and to Garth and Pierre for organizing everything. Uh, I'm based in Cape Town in South Africa. Uh, part of, I'm a family doctor. Uh, as part of the work that uh, I do, I'm particularly interested in aging and uh, as such, uh, I'm the director of a research institute focused on aging. Part of the work we've been doing during the COVID pandemic has been looking at uh, NCDs. And um, if we can just move to the next slide, please, Pierre. So, um, the Sustainable Development Goals of the WHO, WHO uh, and the United Nations uh, talk about uh, SDG 3 is looking at healthy lives and well-being for all. And um, if we look at what the COVID pandemic has had, the impact that it's had is that uh, many countries, over 70 countries, have now stopped doing childhood vaccinations. Uh, there's been an impact on cancer screening. There's been an impact on family planning. Uh, and there has been an impact on uh, the non-COVID infectious diseases such as TB and HIV. So we've got to understand that what we're doing in terms of management of NCDs and, um, and all health problems uh, have been significantly impacted by uh, COVID. If we can move to the next slide, please. The aim of the SDGs is, SDG 1 is to end poverty by 2030. 
currently there are about 700 million people living in extreme poverty and that's defined as living on less than $1.90 per day. And what's estimated is that uh, due to the pandemic, uh, there are going to be 71 million extra people in extreme poverty. Uh, the income loss to low and middle income countries is in the order of about $221 billion uh, and it's possibly going to be much greater than that. And we also know that about 55% of the population uh, globally have no access to any social protection. So clearly um, we have to be very mindful of the uh, social, as uh, has been previously spoken about, the social determinants of disease. If we can move to the next slide. Um, the thing is, what can we take out as, if we ever think about something positive from what we can learn from the pandemic is, and I think uh, it's phrased really well by uh, Antonio Guterres, who's the uh, Director General of the United Nations, uh, Secretary General, sorry, of the United Nations, to say that really, just to paraphrase him, we should actually leave this pandemic with a stronger system uh, than uh, we went into it. And we need to look at how we can rebuild society and we can build, uh, build uh, to be more equitable and allow us to deal with issues that will be impacting us in the future. If we can go to the next slide, please. So the current World Health Organization model is based on what's called this five by five model for non-communicable diseases. And those are the five diseases, namely cardiovascular diseases, including cerebrovascular disease, such as stroke, cancer, diabetes, chronic respiratory diseases, mainly uh, obstruct, uh, chronic obstruct, uh, obstructive pulmonary disease and asthma, and then mental ill health. And then looking at five risk factors, namely tobacco use, unhealthy diets, our physical inactivity, harmful alcohol use, and air pollution. Um, and that's very much focused on a Western world model of uh, and, and relatively high income model of, uh, of, of NCDs. The Lancet Commission, which uh, was completed earlier this year, um, spoke about the bottom billion poorest people. And they've included in that uh, in injuries, and uh, so it's non-accidental injuries and, uh, and trauma. And in the lowest income groups and the lowest poorest groups, um, it makes up one third of all the disease burden. So NCDs are not really only a problem of high income countries, but very, very significantly that of low middle income countries. Next slide, please. So if we have to ask what makes us age differently, there's a tiny impact that our genetics have on our, our, our aging processes, um, but who we are, um, our gender, our sex, um, our access to various healthcare services, our behavior and where we live is most, most important. And these are all related to the social determinants of disease that play a significant role in our health and well-being. Next slide, please. As of Friday, there were about th just over 36 million cases of confirmed cases of COVID in the world. Um, of which there were 350,000, just under, uh, over 350,000 new cases in the, in, in the previous day. And to date, we've had just over a million deaths from COVID. And if you look at this uh, map from the WHO, you can see that the countries that are most affected at this point are where we've had over a million cases to date are the Soviet Union, the USA, Brazil, uh, India, and then, as you can see, there's an increasing number in, uh, in relatively high density areas like, like Western Europe and Canada. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, the world's population is getting older. We're going to be seeing a total growth in the world's population from say 2000 to the year 2050, a 50% growth, uh, where we had about 6 billion people on the planet in 2000, we'll be looking at about 9 billion come 2050. Um, if we look at the age range over the age of 60, we're going to see 
uh, the fastest growing group in, in the fastest growing segment of the population is going to be in the people over the age of 60. And we're going to see almost a 400% increase in older people living in less developed countries. So we will be seeing about 1.6 billion people over the age of 60 living in low and middle income countries by the year 2050. If we can move on, please. And that's reflected in this slide over here, where by 2050, the vast majority of the world will be um, have a population of between 10 and 30 percent of their population uh, being over the age of 60. And countries such as China, most of Western Europe, Canada, uh, Japan will have a population uh, of 60 or older being about 30% of the population. Um, if we can move on to the next slide. So coming on to specifically um, NCDs. Um, we have, as part of the work that we've done, as I mentioned earlier, is we've looked at what we could recommend to the national government uh, in terms of uh, improving quality of uh, NCDs and service delivery around NCDs. We've come up with these 12 major recommendations. First of all, that uh, NCDs need to be, or management of NCDs, um, needs to take an integrated care approach, okay? Aligning uh, and collaboration within the healthcare systems uh, between the admin, the clinical and organizational levels. Um, we need to focus on community-based and home-based care. Um, bringing into to play community health workers, uh, looking at what we call a community-oriented primary care model. We need to emphasize prevention and promotion and involve communities and, and the people themselves who have uh, NCDs in uh, disease management. There needs to be self-management for patients, uh, a shared uh, decision-making with the healthcare team. We need to empower patients uh, and, and allow for people to do self-care and, and management, which it would be critical for healthy aging. We need to focus on things like comprehensive assessment, a comprehensive geriatric assessment. And this needs to be the basic element of all integrated care models for older population. There needs to be a care coordinator for older persons with multimorbidity. Um, and the lack of care coordination is a significant problem as it can lead to fragmented healthcare and inappropriate polypharmacy and overprescribing. There needs to be a rational and proper referral system and appointments if the comprehensive assessments are to have value. We need to have appropriately trained multidisciplinary teams, recognizing that older people have complex and multidimensional health and psychosocial needs. And we need to provide person-centered, coordinated, integrated care for older people with the chronic conditions. And multidisciplinary input will be essential to that. We need to focus on new technologies, on digitalization and at being a data-rich system. Um, so we can transform the healthcare systems and strengthen the healthcare integration by facilitating the collaboration between different healthcare workers, healthcare teams and the patients, and the collection and use of health data. We need to recognize that facilities have to be made age friendly, and that we also need to focus on evidence-based guidelines for managing multimorbidity in older persons. At the moment, most guidelines are very disease specific, and care plans do not consider comorbidities. So clinical guidelines for non-communicable diseases need to be adapted to take multimorbidity and the health needs of older adults into account. And lastly, there needs to be a very, very strong focus on intersectoral collaboration, both at a national, local, and, and provincial state level government. And it needs to be um, looking at intersectoral collaboration between social services, health services, uh, the built environment, etc. If we can move on to the next slide, please. So we need to make non-communicable disease management services more age-friendly post-COVID. Um, we need to look at the strategic frameworks and the needs of our aging population, non-communicable diseases, intersectoral collaboration, community home-based care, and we need to talk about appropriately um, 
train multidisciplinary teams. If we can move to the next slide, almost finished. Um, focusing on, a, on telemedicine and e-health. We need to look at how we dispense medication, how medications are delivered to people in their homes uh, using novel uh, programs such as community health workers to deliver medication rather than asking older persons to come into our community health clinics. Uh, we need to place a much stronger focus on self-monitoring and, man and management. And we do need to look at uh, how we restructure primary health care service delivery. I'd finally like to, if we could come to the last slide, please, just um, bring your attention to a novel project that was implemented in Cape Town uh, by uh, the Department of Health, uh, the Western Cape Department of Health, which is our provincial department, uh, which was called the Vector Telemedicine Project. Um, and what this project did was it, people who were diabetic or have diabetes uh, were contacted by telephone. And prior to the intervention, uh, prior to this model, um, of the 2,558 uh, um, people who were known to have diabetes admitted to facilities with COVID, uh, there was a 28% mortality. Post the intervention, and this was really just reaching out by telephone, advising people who were diabetic, uh, diabetics on how to manage the illness and, and be aware of the symptoms of COVID, uh, the mortality rate was reduced down to 4.5%. So there was a, a, almost a six to seven fold reduction in total mortality. Um, and if this was a medication, it would be a blockbuster drug. It's a very simple intervention, had a significant impact, and we can do things differently. We can do things better. And I think we can learn a lot from COVID in terms of how we can do things better. Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity to, to present today. And um, I welcome any questions in the Q&A later. Thank you very much, Leon. That was very interesting. And I believe you have a report um, titled The Better Health Program South Africa. Uh, and that would be you would be willing to make the link available to people if they're interested You're in more, that. With the greatest of pleasure, people can contact me Thank with the greatest of pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And it is wonderful how uh, COVID is teaching us so many things so quickly, uh, despite everything. So uh, our next presenter is uh, Sania Sabsvari. Uh, who's an Associate Professor at the Department of Family Medicine, Aga Khan University in Karachi. And she's going to talk uh, rather, uh, just to pique your curiosity, uh, she's titled her talk, COVID-19 and its impact on the three Ds. So Sunia will tell us what those three Ds are as we go through. Thank you, Sunia. Thank you, Dimitri. Um... Um, you know, I just, I was with the first presentation, Professor Lees, I just wanted to share with everyone that my mother finally learned to use a smartphone in the lockdown. And she's become a real teenager. We can't get her off the phone. So, I mean, really, there's, you know, there, there are small silver linings and in, in good things we're seeing in the, in the last few months, despite all the, you know, the difficulties that we've encountered, I think, across all age groups. So um, what I'm going to do in the next uh, 10 minutes or so is I'll be talking about the situation in Pakistan as far as COVID-19 is concerned and what uh, experiences we had with our older patients. Um, so can we go to the first slide, please? Thank you. So um, if you can see here, about 7% of our population is 60 years and older. And um, unlike many other countries, we really don't have a formal health program for geriatric health. I think we have a handful of uh, geriatric physicians in Pakistan. Geriatrics is not recognized as a specialty and we really don't have, I mean, we have some government um, uh, elderly care senior acts, but they've been poorly implemented. So largely um, our older patients end up either doing self-pay or their families actually support them for their financial and medical needs. Now with that background, when COVID-19 hit us, uh, we had a few other challenges, um, especially for this age group. 
we all know the social isolation, you know, hit this age group the hardest. But, you know, the other things and, and that we noticed was, uh, as our last presenter said, lots of comorbid illnesses um, got neglected because of lockdowns and social distancing, etc. And the other thing which may be unique to us, and I'm not sure if it happened elsewhere, is that we uh, ran out of medic medicines. Uh, as an example, um, lots of patients reported that their you know, parents who had dementia, they could not find medicines for, the, for dementia, probably because imports were limited because of the uh, pandemic. Um, so next slide, please. So what I'm gonna do is I'll share some cases with you, these which are primarily um, of a neuropsychiatric context um, with the patients that we encountered in the last few months. So um, if you haven't guessed yet, I'm, I'm, which I'm sure you have, the three Ds are basically dementia, depression, and delirium. Uh, so next slide. So um, the, the two, two principles that I, we sort of adhered to, uh, as you see in these cases, is number one, that no matter what the presentation is and how simple it seems, you must always rule out organic reasons for whatever you're seeing, whatever neuropsychiatric manifestation we see. And number two, in our uh, part of the world, um, and I think in a lot of uh, um, countries in our region, the family continues to be responsible for and uh, help with the day-to-day -day caregiving of their older family members. So we utilize that setup to our advantage and to the advantage of our patients. And you'll see that in, in each of the cases, you'll see that that's how we used our context to the advantage of our patient and help them in managing what was going on. Um, so this is case one, uh, April 2020, we are a month into the COVID-19 lockdown. Uh, a 76 year old man with dementia and diabetes leaves home and wanders off. He sounds several hours later, walking in a daze in his neighborhood. And I get a panic email from his daughter who is uh, in a different country uh, and she can't come because of the lockdown. And so we are, I arranged to teleconsult with her. She's sitting there, I'm sitting here and the, and the patient's elsewhere. And his access again to you know, uh, an e-consultation is just not possible. Uh, what happened was the caregiver said that the patient had gotten agitated because his routine of you know, his twice daily walks were disrupted because of the lockdown. And um, which is why he was becoming agitated, trying to get out of the house, and the caregiver had been instructed not to let um, him, him leave. Uh, so that's what happened. So um, the first thing that came to mind was, is this a case of neglect or even worse, abuse? Um, so I think that was the first question, you know, we kind of ended up talking to the, the daughter. And uh, uh, what we did was, and we said, okay, how do we manage this? Because the patient can't come to us, the daughter's not there. So she asked the patient's niece to go in and check. And what we looked out for and we instructed the niece was, you know, look for any physical signs of abuse, obviously, any bruises, contusions, et cetera. Fortunately, none were found. We said, let's try and see how the patient feels around the caregiver. Is he anxious, afraid? Or do you see any tension in his muscles, body language changes? And fortunately, that was not found either. And the last thing was we said, well, let's see if the caregiver seems dominating. Is he allowing the patient to have a conversation with you, the niece, or not? And fortunately, you know, all of those fears were allayed. Um, and the, the patient actually seemed quite attached to his caregiver. Uh, and um, the next thing that we decided to do was let's look for physical reasons as to why he's getting agitated. Um, is he in pain? Is there severe constipation? Any change in medications? Uh, does he have enough supply of his meds? And, and we ruled all that out. So a simple solution that we found for this gentleman was that the niece found an isolated pathway close to his house where there was a not, uh, not a lot of traffic, a physical traffic. And they decided to take him on that path and resume his twice daily walks. And within a few days, his agitation actually improved. And I got a, you know, a, an email from the daughter saying, that, oh, we sorted it out. So that was, that was a case of dementia, uh, again, with the impact of uh, lockdown and what, what happened with him. So the next case, next slide. Okay, so this is case number two, an 80-year-old woman with arthritis and osteoporosis. 
she actually became quiet and withdrawn and she stopped eating and actually lost weight of about five kgs in three months. Now, this is a thin lady. She was probably about 50, 52 kgs to begin with. So this was significant weight loss. And she did report some sadness and anxiety. On exploration of the background, we found that um, the, um, actually it's, it's not the, it's the family member of the patient's caregiver had contracted COVID-19. And the son who lived with his mom and was a very devoted son decided to um, give two months off to the caregiver because he was concerned that she would actually bring COVID-19 home to his mom. Uh, so what he did was he started preparing his mom's meal. So he made breakfast for her, made lunch for her, and he left for work and he would come back in the evenings like, like, like before. The caregiver, however, was the only contact for this lady to the outside world. So she was sitting alo home alone all day uh, in isolation, more so than the rest of the world. And, uh, and, and the son thought that this was the reason why this happened. Now, uh, we sort of agreed with him, but we said, well, the weight loss is significant. Let's make sure that there is no organic cause. So we did some lab work, other investigations. Again, fortunately, those were all within normal limits. Um, uh, what we then, spoke to the son and we said, well, let's, how do we manage this? You know, you can't sit at home, what do we do? So what he suggested to us and we said, well, it sounds like a good idea. He decided to get the caregiver tested uh, out of his own expense. He uh, ran two COVID-19 tests. We suggested do it that way to be safe over a period of a week. Uh, the caregiver fortunately tested negative both times. And he asked her to come in as a live-in caregiver for a few weeks till her family got rid of the COVID-19 um, infection. And she was able to do that, obviously with, with extra compensation. She came, uh, lived in his house with the mother. And within a few days, we noticed that the woman started eating a little better. And within two weeks or so, she, her weight came back to almost her baseline. So that was a, a case of depression, you know, again, because of the social isolation. Uh, in the pandemic. So the last case, uh, case three, if you can go to the next slide. This is a 72 year old woman with uh, diabetes, hypertension, heart disease. She lives alone and she was unable to go see her doctor for a routine follow up because of the COVID-19 um, lockdown. Um, again, access to care has been uh, quite a challenge for patients, I think the world over, especially for this age group. So her daughter visits her to find the patient confused and drowsy, and she arranged a teleconsult. Um, the history revealed that the patient had been confused for two days. This was the maid who, who kind of reported that. Uh, she was disoriented and she was sleeping through the day and up all night. Um, so because this was an acute confusional state, we did um, tested her for delirium. We did uh, the confusion assessment method and found that she was the, fulfilling the criteria for delirium. We actually advised that the patient be moved to the hospital for a complete workup. Uh, but the daughter refused and the patient in her lucid moments also uh, wished that she did not want to go to the hospital. So, you know, keeping in mind the risks and sharing the risks with the patient's daughter, uh, we advised them to go ahead and get, get tests done again to find out the underlying reasons for the, um, the delirium. What we found out was that the patient had actually ran out of her med medicines. Uh, for the last 10 days, she was on no medicine because she ran out and she was unable to get her prescription filled. Um, and her blood sugars had shot up to 300 and then she also ended up having a urinary tract infection. Um, with the daughter's help again, we identified a home nurse who could uh, come in for about a week. Uh, we got her on antibiotics uh, gave her some temporary insulin to kind of work with her sugars um, and the patient's delirium uh, improved over the next seven or ten days and she would manage to get back onto her oral hypoglycemics and we ensured with the daughter's help the patient's medications uh, wouldn't run out uh, the next time so um, you know these were the three uh, different d's that we saw and and many others like this uh, some with not so um, uh, such positive outcomes, these three were the ones which actually did rather well 
but I think this is what the COVID-19 pandemic brought for us. So um, I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, at the end of the, the session. Thank you. Thank you, Sunia. And I think those cases really illustrate um, the combination of excellent medicine and the full psychosocial approach uh, of, the, of the family doctor. Um, uh, and it's great. And it's come out, in fact, in all of the uh, presentations so far. And so now we're going to proceed to uh, our last speaker, Nina uh, Kopchava Gucek from the University of Ljubljana in Slovenia. And Nina has joined us from the SIG on family violence. Um, and there's a small uh, case from myself uh, in this, but it's Nina's work, this uh, particular presentation. Uh, and uh, we like to um, collaborate with some of the other SIGs because there's a lot of overlap uh, between our work. And in fact, someone's all, already, uh, Sania has already referred to the possibility of elder abuse uh, uh, happening. Um, and it's a constant theme uh, during the pandemic. So thank you, uh, Nina, we'll let you go ahead. Uh, thank you, dear Dimitri. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers, most of all, Professor Pond, for inviting me to be a part of this important event. It is my impression, and also several also WHO um, guidelines, that care for the elderly is one of the uprising problems, one of the uprising issues in uh, medicine. And maybe the COVID situation even promoted that. Uh, educating and informing healthcare experts about geriatric problems has been mentioned in the previous presentations of my esteemed predecessors. However, I take this today's event as a contribution to this. By 2050, we should all know much more about taking care of the elderly. Uh, just to mention how violence against older people includes physical, psychological, sexual violence, financial abuse, and neglect. Neglect, maybe, in the times of COVID is most burning, and it has been mentioned today several times. Uh, just to say how frail this group is, how, how frail the elderly are, is that mental issues can have devastating effect on their health of well-being. The chronic disease might be worsened just for extreme stress or psychological abuse. Such situation can even lead to death. Uh, and violence against older people has risen sharply since the beginning of, of COVID-19. The imposition of lockdown additionally increased risk of violence. Today, the issues of communication for the elderly has been greatly discussed already and some very impressive and inspiring possibilities and examples of good practices were mentioned. So I'm not gonna talk about that. Uh, I would like maybe to mention the travel difficulties. Maybe the help and the aid and the care of the uh, family members could be better were it not for the lockdown. The public transportation has closed down and where it hasn't closed down, the elderly people feared to travel. There were several other fears. They feared to impose on the already burdened health system. They feared of infection. So this fear is one of the entities which may be particularly uh, typical for the elderly. Can I have the next slide, please? So the caregivers and the elderly were mentioned today several times. Uh, factors increasing elder abuse during the COVID, some I already mentioned. Uh, just to say how burning were the social institutions for the elderly. I know that it is a global issue, a global challenge. The social institutions for the elderly, the elderly homes, or however the community hospitals for the elderly, however we call them, they had majority of deaths registered in those institutions compared to the outside. Also, the social isolation and loneliness has been already mentioned today. It could also be due to the 
impossibility to physically come to them and the cognitive issues when trying to communicate in all those splendid ways that were introduced today already cognitive issues in the elderly might be a problem. The multimorbidity has been mentioned already and the fact that we may be for a time when we were dealing extremely concentrated on the COVID, the multimorbidity typical for the elderly was somehow neglected and the care of the cardiovascular and other chronic disease was in the second plan, so to say, not to mention the lack of drugs. The mental health problems increased, I'm sure. Dependency of the caregivers was really extreme in some cases. My colleagues from the SIG reminded me that some people were noticed to have died of thirst, dehydration, or maybe lack of food. It is one thing to be able to order the food from the market, but some people really literally had to be fed. And the shortage of personnel in several parts of the world, be it medical personnel or simple caregivers, the shortage due to lockdown, due to quarantine, due to risk of being infected has caused the care, I'm speaking of the basic care such as food and drink to be a very, very big risk factor for the death of the people, not to mention that the multimorbidity and not taking drugs for other diseases could make them even more prone to complications of COVID when they got infected. The financial dependency goes both ways. In some cases, the caregivers are dependent on the elderly. Some people are unemployed, depending on the pension of the elderly people, and vice versa. Maybe some elderly are dependent on the uh, money of their children or caregivers. And in these cases, some financial flows were disconnected. There was a lot of redundancy, so the financial issues can also be mentioned. The anxiety and depression, of course, make alcohol and substance use much more likely in the caregivers, as well as maybe in some of the elderly. And as already mentioned, the lack of personnel and of the very basic, not only medical care, was very worrying. Can I have the next slide, please? To mention ageism would probably be right place and time today. Ageism is the stereotyping, prejudice, and discrimination towards people just because of their age, and it has worsened during the pandemic. And the gender inequalities and prolonged exposure to their abusers increasing the risk of gender-based violence against older women specifically. Not only old women, but older people, older women as more frail group. Can I have the next slide, please? So uh, what governmental measures were there to uh, counter fight the elderly abuse? A lot of raising awareness campaigns against violence were being promoted in the professional and in the public domain in several countries. There were also measures to adjust the capacity of shelters and increase the times of the phone helplines. Developing alternative ways to deliver the services was also seen. There were several chat systems set up, people introduced to WhatsApp, and we already heard some of the very good ideas and counseling platforms, of course, as well. Providing social support and psychological assistance to victims seemed to be increasing. There were some specialist in institutions in my country, the Association of the Psychotherapists offered free help and consulting on the phone five to six hours every day, completely free of charge to especially for your groups, children and the elderly. Financial support in some countries was released to victims of violence. Money itself could release the financial pensions, which are one of the risk factors. So not directly, but indirectly, the financial support could release the possibility and the risk factors for violence. Uh, special um, efforts were made to ensure access to information for, to, uh, for the especially um, exposed groups, groups exposed to violence. So uh, special new phone lines and new electronic addresses were set up. Uh, so if the person was monitored by the perpetrator of violence for contacting certain, certain services, other new groups, other new uh, chat groups, other new um, 
meeting points and new phone numbers were set up for the same services just to cover them and to see, to give the possibility to the victims to contact them. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? This is just a so-called window visit that I know you all have been partial to. Um, this one is especially dear to my heart because I suspect maybe this doggy was um, the dog of the elderly maybe and she maybe got sicker and somebody else had to take care of the dog. So um, uh, the home pets are also very therapeutical in such times and hopefully they brought some solace to the sick people. Uh, and I'm mentioning window uh, uh, visits in the domain of outside uh, the institutions and also in America within the institutions, I was informed several window visits for the elderly just to see their people, were to see their relatives, their caregivers were um, performed and it helped a lot. Of course, hugs were greatly missed and still are. Nothing to replace a hug of a dear person. Can I have the next slide, please? So um, how should health providers and social services be aware and what can they do to prevent um, elder abuse? For all of us to be alert of signs and symptoms of abuse, I'm thinking of medical experts as well as wide public. Provide information, care, and support to the caregivers as well. The caregivers are also under stress. The caregivers also experience tension. The caregivers also have issues concerning their other life, not only the care of the elderly. So stress manager, de-escalations, and such techniques are very, very important. To be aware of the risk of the uh, and health consequences of the violence, which I already mentioned, serious serious hair consequences can be just um, uh, due to tension, due to stress, due to shouting or not being very kind to them. Uh, we all still are in training lifelong, I think, for knowledge, for communication skills, for competences to confront situations like this. Can I have the next slide, please? So uh, just to run through the signs of elder abuse, signs of physical abuse, I think are not a big issues. Emotional abru uh, ab abuse can be um, a cause for withdrawal. We saw that in Sonia's um, presentation already. Financial abuse can lead to different transactions and that is also suspicious. Self-neglect, poor, poor hygiene, uh, weight loss, which was mentioned today, dehydration, and um, the caregiver can also uh, display several signs of distress. Can I have the next slide, please? So over to Dimity, who contributed this wonderful case. Dimity, please. Thank you, Nina. Um, I'd just like to say at this point, uh, if the panel would bear with us, we might go for another 10 or 15 minutes past the hour so that we can take some questions. And Pere and Garth, is this okay with you? Maybe it's, one- It's fine, Dimity, yeah, absolutely fine. That's good, thank you very much, Garth, okay. So I'll be quick with this case, uh, which is a case contributed from my practice. Uh, so this is Maria. Um, and so this is a, you know, I live in a, a a, a higher income country, uh, but we still have poverty. So this lady had gifted her house to her son uh, who said he needed it for his business uh, some years ago and he would look after her. And now she finds, and he, he would pay, you know, an allowance to her. And he put her on his books as a, as a paid employee. So this is very much a first world problem, but it's very significant for her. So his business is not going so well in COVID. He has cut her allowance by half. He won't talk to her anymore or answer phone calls. She's essentially by herself in this house. She can't afford to heating now. Um, when I spoke to her, she said she can't get any government help because she's on the books as a paid employee. And in fact, she's getting some allowance, but uh, 
Uh, and he, he threatens her. He threatens her to send her to a mental institution if she complains. And she has been in a mental institution. She's had some depression and so on. Uh, so, yes, you're right. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, that is, in fact, verbal abuse. Yes, those threats. And also isolation. And what I found working with her was... Uh, she didn't want to access, we have a, a, a domestic violence helpline she could access, I gave it to her. Uh, she hadn't even framed this in terms of abuse. She hadn't thought about it as abuse. So I helped her move to thinking that in fact, this was not okay and it was not her fault. And then working with her over a number of weeks, um, I asked her what she was going to do. And she said, what? I said, well, what are you going to do in your situation? So we talked about exercise, going for a walk twice a day. We are not in lockdown at the moment. This is possible. Improving her diet with some extra vegetables. She has a small garden. She can grow some vegetables. Uh, and perhaps a little bit of fish uh, each uh, week, just one uh, amount of fish, uh, just to, for, the, for the mental health help of that. And also she was... Uh, she was, we did some sleep hygiene. She, she'd been having a terrible time at night. So we talked about simple sleep hygiene measures. And she has improved amazingly and begun to take control of her life again uh, in the areas that she can do it. So there are, there's much that we can do, even when people are in very difficult situations with their families. So I'll leave it at that and I hand back to you, Nina. Thank you very much, Dimitri. I think that some very important points came out from your presentation. First of all, it is the invisible violence, such as financial, social pressures, psychological, verbal violence that really is needed to be shed light upon. Broken bones, bruises, we all see. But this kind of violence is just as uh, deteriorating, is just as harmful as physical violence. Second of all, <clears throat> this just shows <clears throat> how universal these pro problems really are. And uh, last of all, I would like to thank again to be able to lecture with Dimitri. Do you all realize Dimitri and I live about 14,000 kilometers apart? Were it not for the COVID, I don't know whether we would share a lecture together. Can I have the next slide, please? So uh, instead of conclusion, I would like to share with you some guiding principles in care of older people. And I have been specially cautioned by the members of my SIG to mention again the interdisciplinary care as one of the most important drives of the care for the elderly and the education that we all need for the education, geriatry, or however it's called in this field. So older people, I'm sure we all agree, have the right to the best possible care. They should have equal opportunity and access to determinants of health, healthy aging, regardless of social position, economical status, place of birth, color, nationality, residence, and other social factors. Care should be provided, provided equally to all without discrimination, particularly without discrimination based on gender or age. This is counterparting the ageism that I have mentioned. Can I have the next slide, please? We often discuss the quality of life and the elderly. And this is an answer of a lady very close to me whom I asked at the age of 96, she died when she was 97. Does she really, how does she find the life worth living? And she said, as long as someone loves you, the life is worth living. Let's not forget that. Can, can I have the next slide, please? This is just to inspire you and to see how the touch and hug and maybe the look in your eyes is important. What thankfulness and love is radiating from this gentleman. And as the last uh, presenter, I was asked to invite you to the next webinar of the Special Interest Group on Complexities in Health in one week, October 18th at 4 UDC. And thank you. Thank you, Nina. That was very inspiring and a really good note um, to finish our presentations on. Um, 
I think, Leon, there's a question that you want to answer uh, in the Q&A. Um, thank you very much. I, I can't seem to type my answer here. I've been trying to. Uh, the question's been asked, what device is used for the teleconsult? Um, it was just telephone consultations uh, using either smart uh, cell phones or, or standard plain old telephone systems. Okay. Uh, and I was asked about the sun in my, um, in my uh, presentation, my case. Would the sun be amenable to talking to me? Um, I, I actually knew this son as a, a, a small child because I've been in my practice for many decades, but I haven't seen him for many years. And I haven't, I haven't attempted to engage him. I believe he's going through a divorce. It's a bit tricky. I've talked to the daughter, but she's not speaking to her mother at the moment either. So it's tricky. It's very tricky. Do we have any other questions, uh, Ping Fu? You've been uh, monitoring other media. So far, there's none uh, from my side. Uh, there's uh, Twitter. Uh, there's no no question from there. Okay, and Farus. Oh, still muted. Yes, there's there's actually two questions on Facebook. Um, one is actually uh, wants the panelists to comment on ageism and how to handle or uh, tackle ageism, uh, especially to do with the elderly. Uh, maybe that's an open question to all panelists. I might, I might go around and ask. And I, I'm going to start with Sania because I think you mentioned this, Sania. Um, you know, it's it's. It's sort of funny in, in our country, um, it, it's, it, there's a double-edged sword. There are people who um, treat older individuals like they're regular adults, especially when it comes to the medical profession. So, you know, they, they don't understand the difference between approaching an older individual versus, versus an adult. Uh, so we have, it, it, it's a sort of reverse, um, you know, here in, in that sense. But then we have this uh, it's very clearly, and it's funny. I see this with students and, and residents sometimes. You know, are, are um, the ones that we teach is that as soon as they approach an older patient, you know, they start speaking loudly. They'll they'll um, you know slow down their speech, just assuming that an older individual can't understand or can't hear. So you know, those are things that I kind of make them um, reflect on and think about is that we don't necessarily need to do that. And one of the commonest beliefs that we have is that most people think, oh, all older people must probably have cognitive decline, must have dementia. So, you know, those are the challenges we try and work with, um, at least with the trainees that we have, because I think if you can make that impact with, with people around you, uh, you know, it, it, it's a small start, but it's a start. Thank you, Sanea. Um, there's a question uh, about artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, what do you think will be the impact in the care of the elderly and in ageism? Um, I'm, I'm thinking Lee King Hock might have an answer, but uh, at least for a start. Yeah. Oh, uh, one thing for sure is going to be increasingly used. Uh, is seen as the you know the future, as we are running out running out of healthcare workers with the aging population. Many people are thinking about uh, AI uh, robots. You know, uh, I think it's the way of the future. I think there will be a lot of funding involved, and many people are interested to fund this. Um, but I think is uh, I think we are sometimes. Uh, uh, our, our optimism in this area tend to overrun what is really practical. It, it will come, but may not be so fast. And I still believe there's always this human dimension that you know, they're so lacking already without AI and robots. And if you introduce that component, I think what we talk about patient-centered care and uh, you know, the human touch will be even more captain than this. Mm -hmm. So I'm a bit pessimistic. <laughs> I don't know what the rest thing. Uh, Any other? Can I, can I add to that? Um, 
You know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, you know, we had a ment uh, mental health week last week, and I was in one of those um, sessions, and they were mentioning how they're using AI actually to determine mental health uh, based on the patient's body language, the stance, the eye contact, uh, and, you know, things like that. So when, when somebody asked this question, I was thinking, hey, why can't we think of using something like that for our patients with dementia and depression? Uh, because there are significant changes in how they, you know, communicate, contact, their, their body language changes significantly. So maybe, um, you know, that could be something to think of, uh, you know, by our scientists, you know, down the line and see if we can develop something like that. That'd be so cool. Thank you, Sunia. Yeah. And Leon, did you have a comment on that? Yeah. So I want to come back to the, I think it links the ageism and the AI issue. Um, in South Africa, the only ism or discriminatory uh, aspect of life that hasn't been stated specifically in our new constitution, which was developed, which was brought into to, to law in 1996, was, is ageism. So we still have forced retirements at the age of 65. Um, and one of the slides that I have is we have Nelson Mandela coming out of prison at the age of 74. And, I, and the slide I put up is where would we be as South Africa if we were forced, if we forced Nelson Mandela to retire at the age of 65? Um, and I think that's a very apt thing to remember that there are many people who have got great ability beyond the age of 65 or into late life. And, and we need to acknowledge that and recognize that. It also comes to the issue around AI. And I think unless we get our healthcare services and systems correct at the basis, technology is not going to correct the issues around societal prejudices. It's not going to improve the the, the, the communication that we have between healthcare professionals in an interdisciplinary team way. And I think, and, and, and looking at complexity of care and um, comorbidities, et cetera, AI will help us make decisions about how to implement the best treatment strategies, et cetera. But we have to work on the human element. And I think if we don't work on the human element in terms of how we engage with older people, how we engage amongst ourselves as healthcare professionals, how we work in terms of a healthcare team, I don't think we're going to get these things right yet. Thank you, Leon. Nina. Yeah, may, uh, thank you, Leon. You touched several things that I had in mind. But um, other than uh, saying that uh, treating elderly equally to all others in the medical field is not a question of all, uh, equity is built into Hippocrates' oath, and every human being deserves to be treating with love, care, and respect. I would like to transfer this in the general life. But what I wanted to say really is that I am often in contact with um, computer people and uh, instructors and such. And they tell me most interesting stories how with what prejudice they were invited to instruct on the use of computers and everything. They were invited into the elderly homes and they said, oh my God, you know, of course I'll go and things like that. They were so surprised how majority of the people, of course, there are, um, there are uh, exceptions, but majority of the people, how well they learned. Not to say that I have 80 plus patients who are very keen of writing and they write me emails, much more um, nicely written uh, with an impeccable grammar and everything compared to young people. So uh, let's um, tackle this prejudice in the future, I think. Wisdom is with the old people. A lot of uh, attributes go to the young, but the wisdom is with the old people. Thank you. Nina, that's almost a, a good line to wind up on. Do we have any other questions, Firuz or Ping Fu, that we should address? I've got another question from Facebook. This is from Rick Patello. Um, he was asking specifically about uh, elderly abuse policies. Is there any specific uh, policies that protects the elderly in uh, different countries? I think maybe the panelists can answer. Dana? It's, uh, yeah, it depends. Thanks for the question. Uh, as I say already in the Declaration of Human Rights, some things are built in that uh, consider all people, all generations, all races. 
all professions socially diverse, however they might be. But there are several countries which have legislature trimmed to violence, especially. Uh, we are doing a project which is called IMOCAF right now in our SIG, whereby we are collecting the data on uh, policies in different countries. And there are several countries who have law, like um, in my country, it was passed in 2007 and updated since several times, but it's called the law against family violence. And it's a special law unto itself, as Frost would say. Um, it would be interesting to, to hear the last, the, uh, the rest of you panelists, uh, esteemed colleagues, what, what is the situation in your countries? I think Leon was wanting to. Yeah. Yeah. In South Africa, the Older Persons Act, which falls under the Department of Social Development, or what was previously the old Social Welfare Department, uh, the Older Persons Act specifically talks about a section, has a section on older persons violence, and it defines uh, violence not only as physical violence, but emotional, uh, economic, uh, so abuse. So, um, and neglect, whole, probably. Neglect. Uh, yeah, yes. So, a broad array. The problem is we have wonderful legislation. It's very, very difficult to implement it because there's very little. Uh, so, that's that goes back to the whole issue of ageism. Uh, and systemic problems in terms of implementation of, of wonderful laws that we have in South Africa. Is there anything anyone else would like to say to finish us? So in, uh, in Singapore in 2018, we passed the Vulnerable Adults Act, which cover uh, abuse of elder, elderly persons as well. Uh, but I think our, our strategy seems to be that we is actually through education, and we are encouraging uh, intergeneration programs to, to get the younger people more attuned to what it's like to be elderly. Uh, in the past, it wasn't such a problem because there's a lot of interaction between uh, the younger people with their grandparents. But as we move away from uh, where families stay together across generations, the opportunity to interact with seniors become less and less. So we are encouraging uh, a lot of programs from the schools uh, to do community service in nursing homes and so on. So they, they understand and they, they mingle with the elderly and get to understand them a bit better. Thank you, Lee King. We, we've had a, a, a TV series uh, called um, Aged Care for Kindergarten and uh, a four-year-olds uh, went uh, on four or five occasions to uh, a large aged care facility and got to know some of the oldies. And they dragged them out to walk with them even when they didn't want to. And uh, you could see the smiles on these older people's faces. So it worked both ways. They were learning wisdom and they were also giving a lot. Yeah. I think we need to wind up. Um, I think... Uh, I'd like to thank our panelists, um, all of our panelists, uh, Nina, Sania, Leon, and Lee Kang Hock. And I would particularly like to thank Ping Fu and Farooz Ali for um, fending uh, off uh, questions and going behind the scenes and uh, answering some emails that came urgently from people. I think we've wound it up there. Thank you, everyone. I think it's been yeah, very thank, good. thank you, Timothy, and thank you to all the panel. Um, really excellent presentations, very, very enjoyable. Um, and the next couple of weeks, I think, are, are, are really quite relevant to the topic as well. Um, Leon mentioned complexity, and so next week's, next week's webinar on complexities in health uh, will obviously be relevant. And the following week is on mental health issues. And again, very, very um, relevant to so much of the stuff that was talked about today. But thanks to all the panel, really great presentations. And thanks, thanks to all of you who have taken part. Take care and we'll see you next week, hopefully. Thank you, guys. Well, thank you. Everyone. Well, thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.